So good morning. I hope you enjoyed the keynote. Oops, that's a bit too loud. I don't want to scare people off. <clears throat> so let's do a, an estimation exercise here, just quickly to get us warmed up, right? So that we know what we're talking about. So my name is Vasco. And uh, when do you think I'm going to be finished with this presentation? Any guesses? Today. Today? <laughs> Very likely so, Peter, nice to see you, finally, face to face. But that has a very large error margin, so probably the conference guys would not be uh, happy if I told, ah, I'll be done today. It's like, what? But the deadline is fixed. <clears throat> the deadline is fixed, now we're getting somewhere, okay, cool. And is it, it, why is the deadline fixed, like who has fixed it? Managers. <laughs> probably the conference managers, right? Yeah. Why did they do that? Like, why did they say, hey, Vasco, you have until 11? Because people want coffee. People want coffee. There are other priorities. And also, there's another speaker coming. And the next speaker will probably not be very happy if I go and talk over, I think it's his slot, right? Would you be happy if it happened to you? And also, there are people who want to see the next speaker, because I'm like so boring that obviously they want to see the next guy as quickly as possible, please. Get this guy off the stage. So there's a deadline, which is externally imposed, and I have stuff to talk about that could bore you for a month. How am I going to fit that into 40 minutes? Actually, a bit less now, because we're already one or two minutes over the time we should start. How am I going to fit that into 40 minutes? Any guesses? Time boxing. Time boxing. Very good. How many of you practice time boxing at work? Not enough of you. OK, cool. Um, so time boxing is this idea that you give yourself a fixed amount of time. And you do not change that time. You just change what you do with the time you have. A bit like being alive, you know, like human beings. You know, you have X years, you know, whatever, 79, 78, 85, 93, 120, some people do, not me, probably. But that's what we have, right? And you wouldn't want to estimate your life. You would want to get as much out of it in the time you have. And you know that your time is limited, right? So why do we estimate projects as if time was unlimited, as if capacity to work was unlimited, as if magically we knew what to do, how to do it, and exactly how much time it would take? Because in real life, we don't use estimates for that, right? You go like, well, my movie starts at 11, the commercials last for about 20 minutes, so I have a 20 minute buffer, but if I'm there at like 12, I'm not going to see the movie. Period. You're not going to say, hey, hey, please, hey, you know, dear movie theater manager, can you please just delay the release date of the movie so I can make it on time? Also, your customers are probably not very happy when you send them a, an email, a very happy email, all well designed by your marketing department, saying, hey, we're very happy to announce these all new features, and the release date is now February 2018, when you initially promised January 2017. Right? So why do we keep on doing this horrible idea of estimating? Why do we keep on making decisions based on estimates that, and I'll show you the data, not guessing here, I have data with me, it's impossible to be good at. So today I'm going to talk about the 10, well actually 11 principles, you get one principle for free <laughs> today. Because, well before we go to the principles, um, you can download the book today, and the URL is there, and the URL will show up in other slides, so you don't need to rush to write it down, but if you want, it's okay. Uh, the book will explain how do you get to know estimates, because that's why I wrote the book, because I was getting all of these questions, and then I decided, okay, it's time to put down in writing how this could happen in practice. So that's what the book does, and it answers many of the questions related to what we are going to talk about today. Uh, hopefully, in an entertaining manner, certainly the illustrations are great by Angel Medinilla, a friend who illustrated the book for me. 
But let's look at reality now. Like, there's a lot of places where no estimates is completely alive. I mean, you guys remember this, right? And I'm sorry about the result of Estonia this weekend. <laughs> but these guys, they really made a surprise, right? Like, everybody was estimating that uh, Iceland would just not be a player, a contender in the Euro Cup. But uh, here's the scorer, Gunnarsson, I think, is the guy's name. Aren't they all called that? <laughs> and uh, here's the Portuguese player in the back with his hands in his head and say, like, oh my God, the project is delayed again. No, I mean, <laughs> they scored the goal. Nobody expected that. Like, you remember, uh, where was that from? Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, Monty Python, right? This is the Spanish Inquisition right there. And the project delays are also the Spanish Inquisition. We could actually do a Monty Python sketch about project delays, right? Yeah, definitely. Somebody should do that, by the way. Send me the link, I'll publish it. But here we go, the guys who almost lost against Iceland actually won the competition. And here's the thing, people were actually happy. I know I was, I'm Portuguese, by the way. So people were actually happy for all estimates to be wrong. Think about that. Now, the thing is, obviously, people, when people bet in football, they're not stupid enough to bet all of their money in a football match. I mean, some people are, but you know, they exit the gene pool. <laughs> Suicide and stuff. But other than that, it's fine. Like, nobody's gonna be stupid enough to do that. Like, why do we then bet all of our money in projects? I don't know how about, how, huh. I don't know how many of you have been in such projects, but there are projects that are kind of pictured as the saviors of the company, right? If we do this, if we release this new version, if we do this change, if we enter this market, we will all be saved. And then we go and we spend lots of time doing work breakdown structures and estimation, and having lots of meetings, only to have the project delayed by a year or two or even more. So why do we make that kind of bets with projects? We wouldn't do it with football because we ac accept that estimates are not always right in football. Why do we accept that estimates are always right in software? And when you say, oh, of course we don't expect estimates to be right, you're exaggerating. Well, if you don't expect them to be right, why are you making decisions based on that? Project management offices make investment decisions based on estimates. This is ridiculous, and I'll show the data to prove it. But this 10, actually 11 principles, because this one goes all the way up to 11, are going to tell you some of the basic rules that help you to apply no estimates. And even if you don't apply no estimates, it helps you to be sane even when estimating. So this is interesting for you if this is how you feel going into an estimation meeting. Like, what? Again? Didn't we just do this like two weeks ago? By the way, why do we need to re-estimate the whole backlog again? Like, why? What's the benefit? It's all going to be the same anyway. We're the same people working on the same technology with the same scope. Why do we need to re-estimate this again? Shared resources. Shared resources. Ooh, there we go. We just found one of the root causes why estimates don't bloody work. <laughs> all right, how about this one? When you're asked for an estimate, you feel like, oh my god, it's going to blow up in my face. <laughs> that, that's how I felt most of the time. And actually, that was most of the time correct. I used to be a project manager. I'm a recovering project manager now. <laughs> but that's exactly how I felt. And I knew for a fact that I was lying when I was giving people estimates. And that's why I always added, at the end of every project plan in a PowerPoint, very well structured and pretty and with all the right colors, I always added, this will hold if nothing goes wrong. And when was the last project you were in that nothing went wrong? Never. Yeah, most of us are not lucky to be young enough to have had that experience. <laughs> and finally, this is about making customers happy and making yourselves happier. Because estimates are a losing, self-destructive habit we have developed because we try to copy things that 
through sheer luck, worked in other industries. And now we're trying to apply them to the software industry, which is new. By the way, guys, um, even the oldest people in the room are not old enough to have built the pyramids <laughs> or Roman bridges, right? We're using technology that even the Romans and the Egyptians said, why would we use that? I mean, we have the slaves, there's the rocks, why don't we just put them together? <laughs> we have a deadline, I mean, the pharaoh will die at some point. <laughs> so let's just build the damn pyramid. The Roman bridges, however, were built totally different. So you know how these days we do like these structural calculations to see that the bridge, you know, will sustain the the side current of the river or the wind or whatever. You know what the Romans did? Let's just put more rocks in it. And why? Because they knew that if you had less rocks, it would crumble. They didn't estimate. They overcompensated for a problem they knew was going to happen. Right? And that's why, by the way, you can still walk on Roman bridges today. And there's many bridges that were built 20 years ago but are now gone because those bridges that were built 20 years ago were estimated to survive the you know, bad weather, rivers, and stuff like that, erosion, and so on. So if we look at history, we kind of actually know how this thing goes. It's like, if you really want something to work, you don't estimate it. You just make it, test it, improve it, test it, improve it, test it, satisfied with it, OK, now go to market. And this, by the way, is what Agile is all about. But we'll talk about that in a second. Now, let me tell you a story. This is a train. Who knows this train? Yep. Shinkansen. Shinkansen, precisely. So let me tell you a stat about this train. So this train had an average of 54 seconds delay in 2014. That's the average, and that's measured in seconds. Now, I don't know how trains work here in Estonia. But in most countries, they don't measure delays in seconds. Mostly they measure it in minutes, some of them measure it in hours, and in some countries the trains never show up. <laughs> but here's the thing, projects are exactly the same, right? I mean, if you're taking the Shinkansen from Osaka to Tokyo, and you have a very important meeting at 10 a.m., you can actually go in the train that drops you at the station where the client has the office about half an hour before the meeting starts because you trust it will be on time. So you don't stress, you go calmly into the train, you enjoy your time in the train, you know when it's about two seconds later from the arrival time, you're probably already at the station. What happens when you take the train in Estonia? I don't know how it happens here, so I can't say that, but I, I live in Finland most of the year. And when I take the train from Helsinki to Tampere, for example, I want to make sure I'm there two hours before. And the reason is very simple, is that it takes about two hours to drive from Helsinki to Tampere. So I know that if the train stops somewhere, I can call a cab and I will probably be on time in the meeting. When I really want to be, sh be sure that I'm on time, I'm going the day before. Then I sleep in Tampere and I'm fine and you know, fresh and early in the morning I'm at the client. What am I doing? I'm overcompensating for a known failure. If your projects were like the Shinkansen, you wouldn't need to worry about failure, you wouldn't need to worry about being late, but are they? So this is the first principles of no estimate. Either you trust your process, the Shinkansen, or you change your process. This is what the Shinkansen designers did. They designed a whole train system to be on time. Right? It's not, oh, we'll estimate that it takes X minutes to go from station A to station B. No, we'll design the line, we'll you know, protect the train line so there's no animals or cars crossing it, so that it will be on time. We design the process from the ground up to be on time. We don't do that. In most software projects in the world, still today, unfortunately, we're using project methodologies that will never be on time most of the time and that are designed to fail. So why would we do that? Here's a project that I did, a waterfall project, by the way, so I wanted to give you a very important contrast here. So development phase is about this long and then 
the testing, or what I call desperately testing and fixing phase, starts. And you see the blue line here, dark blue line here. It's just the number of open defects in the system, the ones we found, obviously. There's more there, we just haven't found them. And you can see that, like this starts to grow already pretty early in the development phase, and it continues to grow and continues to grow and continues to grow. Like if we were here, the question is, when would we be releasing this project? Any thoughts? That's a very sane answer. If we were here, we would probably think that either never or we just don't know. Because we've been in the software industry for a long time, we know what happens next, right? We have this, we call it the Jira bug bashing party, <laughs> where we go like, won't fix, won't fix, won't <laughs> fix, won't fix. And you see the bug count dropped beautifully. We were very happy with ourselves here. <laughs> Now, obviously, this is an illusion, right? The number of bugs didn't go down. We just decided not to fix them. And we can see it here, like, we continued testing. I was like, oh, this is getting better. Actually, this won't fix, won't fix. <laughs> getting better, getting better, not so much better. Oh, it's now getting better again. And you can see that the line's going up again. And you can easily predict that this line would get up here if we continued testing. Now, why did we release at that point? Any thoughts? Yeah, so the, it, running out of money, good enough, there are all good answers, and actually it's a very variation of running out of money. We ran out of patience, <laughs> i.e. the CEO's patience had run out. So he came down to the team room and said, guys, either we release tomorrow or the can we cancel the project. There's no point in spending more money in this, right? And that's actually how many projects get released. Just we run out of patience. We call it run out of money, but it's really running out of patience. Like, come on, we've been testing this for 90 days. And actually, in this company, we did a, a research of all of the projects, and it turned out that large projects took about three months in desperately testing and fixing phase. And then we looked at mid-sized projects, and they took about 12 weeks. And then we looked at small projects, and we, said, we found out that actually it takes about 90 days. So actually, this desperately testing and fixing phase took about the same time, no matter the size of the project. And then, of course, you have to ask why. I mean, there are no coincidences. There must be something at work here. And obviously, we found out that the reason why it takes 90 days is that that's how long the CEO will wait from the moment you tell them, we're feature complete, to the moment the product needs to go out. Right? This is principle number two. You do not want to do this. You want to have very short feedback cycles. You want to put software out every day if you can. So if you have a one month feedback cycle, you shorten it to two weeks. Right? That's what Scrum did a few years ago. Uh, if you have a two week feedback cycle, you shorten it to one week. That's what XP did already from the beginning. If you have a one week feedback cycle, you shorten it to one day. If you have a one-day feedback cycle, you shorten it to half a day. If you have a half a day feedback cycle, okay, probably you can stop there. But that's the idea. You have to shorten the feedback cycle to get actionable information about how the project is actually going. And if I could say something about Agile, Agile is about one thing and one thing only. It's this principle. It's always there. You know, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, that's about shortening the feedback cycle. People and interactions, instead of processes and tools, that's about shortening the feedback cycle. And so on and so on. You could actually read through the whole Agile manifesto and clearly link that there are different types of feedback cycles that these principles and values are trying to reduce. But can estimates be accurate? Before I show this data, how many of you would be comfortable with presenting an estimate made by a team or multiple teams, if you are in a multi-team environment, to your managing uh, team, like you know, CEO, executive team, program management, whatever. Okay, one, two, three. Again, the others are kind of, I don't understand the question. <laughs> So the thing is, we would present estimates because estimates are used in decision making, right? 
But if they are used in decision making, the assumption is that they can be accurate. Right? So let's look at the data. This is a talk by J.B. Rainsberger. It's about accidental complication, which he defines as we're not really that good at our jobs. And what he talks about, this is, uh, I think, 7 minutes 23 seconds talk. And the name of the talk is 7 minutes 23 seconds. Now, why did he name it 7 minutes 23 seconds? He was trying to make a point about no estimates. You have an argument, you have 7 minutes and 23 seconds, you make the argument fit the time you have. That's it. That's the point he was trying to make. But he also made another point, very interesting point, which is that he said that the cost and duration of anything is a factor of the essential complication. So, you know, if you're trying to calculate your tax percentage in Finland, it's easy, it's always 80%. If you're trying to calculate the tax percentage in Germany, uh, you might have to read this many books in order to get that done. So the essential complication would be higher, right? That's the essential complication. How hard is the problem? But then he said it's a factor with accidental complication. And accidental complication is actually the we are not so good at our jobs thing, right? Like if in the beginning of the project you say, oh, we need to add this type of users. OK, fine, that's a two. And then, you know, midway through the project, that story actually gets worked on. And you go and you start doing your research and you find out that there's actually 27 different ways to add users to the database. So now, instead of adding a user of type X, you actually have to refactor 27 different ways of adding users in order to actually be able to add users of type X. The story is still a two, but now the story is this size. That's what accidental complication is. Now, if you would... Uh, Estimate that task at that task at the beginning of or that story at the beginning of the project It would have a certain meaning in the middle of the project because we have this technical debt that is accumulating It's a totally different thing So what he's actually saying and don't tell this to Mike Cohn is that relative size estimation is complete BS It doesn't work if you know anything about software development relative sizing is useless because the code is in a different state when you're going to work in a story that is in the middle of the backlog that you estimated at the start of the project. So that's his argument, and I happen to believe in it. But there's more to this. How about cues? You know, some people take their cues very seriously. <laughs> how many of you, and keep, uh, put your hands up and keep your hands up, how many of you have removed bugs from Jira or whatever issue tracking system you use that were one month old? Six months old, keep your hands up if you have. One year old, two years old, three years old, five years old, <laughs> seven years old, nine years old. OK, so seven has been my uh, absolute record so far. But now imagine this. The product owner comes to you and says, hey, we need to fix this bug. That was seven years ago. And then he comes to you today and says, hey, about that bug, you said it would take two weeks. It's seven years down the line. <laughs> and you go like, hey, you didn't ask me how long it would take in the queue. So I mean, it can take 10 years in the queue. It will still take two weeks to fix. Wait, didn't we just talk about accident? Wait, no, probably not two weeks anymore. And the product doesn't exist anymore, so why are you asking? <laughs> but the point is that queues have an enormous impact on the time to deliver. Enormous impact. So big that most work we do spends most of their lifespan in a queue. So when the product owner asks you, how long will it take to deliver this story, you have to ask, if you're coherent, do you mean queue time or development time? Because I can tell you the development time, but the queue time you have to tell me. Because I'm not in charge of the queue. I can only work on it. I can tell you the cycle time of an average feature in our project. By the way, Lean has figured out how to account for this. It's called lead time. The time it takes from the moment you add something to a backlog to the moment it goes out into the market. How many of you use lead time when you present estimates to your product management or project management office? Who has used lead time in the past six months? OK, so the rest of you are forgetting about the largest impact on the time it takes to deliver anything, like literally 
anything. So if we can't account for accidental complication, relative sizing doesn't work. If we can't account for lead time, then actually estimating the date of release of anything inside a backlog doesn't work. So can estimates really be accurate? Are we trying to solve a problem that cannot be solved, or at least it's ill-defined? But still, some people say, no, no, we can be good at estimates. I mean, we've done it in the past, right? Okay, let's look at the data. This is how good we've been in the past. Chaos Report 2004, 80% late or failed projects. How about that for a piece of data? But there's more. This is data from 95, but I have you know, more recent data. And in 95, the Chaos Report reported that 68% of all projects in the survey were 51% or more late. <laughs> So majority was 51% or more late, more than two thirds. Cost, uh, chaos report 2009, cost overrun 45%, average time overrun 63%. Chaos report 2011, average time overrun 63%. By the way, this number is exactly what I've seen in other companies with the data that I have collected myself, so I happen to believe in this, but maybe some of you don't like the chaos report, and I know who you are, it's okay. I have more data. So Gartner, survey of project failure, not delays, failure, like total zero value out of the project. Large IT projects, 28% fail, more than a quarter. Mid-sized IT projects, 25% fail, quarter of the projects, and small IT projects, 20% fail, a fifth of the projects. That's how good we are in our industry when we use estimates. How about this? Of the large systems that are completed, and this is Capers Jones writing for the Journal of Defense Software Engineering, so this is not the crazy lunatic from Finland talking about no estimates. He says 66% experience schedule delays and cost overrun. Two thirds of large IT systems in the defense software development industry. This is not, you know, crazy guys developing Skype or Clash of Clans. This is like people who develop software for those that go into battle that might actually die as a result of not having certain software available. So, I mean, this goes on. Traditional projects, 53% failed or challenged. This is project success survey by Scott Hambler, and it gets even more depressing. Because if you thought agile projects were better, think again. They are using estimates anyway, so 40% failed or challenged. But think about this. This is the, the stat that really kicked it for me. 17% of all large IT projects go so badly that they threaten the very existence of the company. This is like, I'll, I'll give you a metaphor. This is like going to the casino betting on the, what is it called, the, the thing that, go, the roulette, and then when you lose, you die. The Russian roulette. <laughs> With six bullets in the chamber. Okay, it's not really six bullets, but it's definitely more than one. This is just the large IT projects. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you use estimates, the best you can hope for is a small chance of success. It could happen that you die trying, but there's a small chance of success. There's more data coming up, and uh, if you want, you can sign up for that. But the principle at work here is believe the data, not the estimates. So when somebody argues that, yeah, you can be better at estimates, you go like, show me your track record. Because it's likely that most people in the world have failed massively at estimating if we believe the data. Now, of course, as with any chance, there's always the chance that you find someone who's been lucky. I was lucky many times, I delivered some projects on time, but that doesn't mean I trust myself to deliver projects on time all the time. I mean, that would be like, you know, being high or in your own supply, you know, the Scarface quote, right? It's like project managers, if you need to estimate, please do, but do not believe those estimates. That would be self-defeating. 
So this is the principle, believe the data, not the estimates. But it gets even better. So this is three guys that are PhD, three guys that are PhD in estimates. And this is their definition of a good estimate. So they say that a good estimate is when we are to, within 25% of the actual result, 75% of the time. Now let me translate this for you, because it took me a while to understand this. This is like you come to my bank, and I'm an investment bank, you give me 100,000 euros, and I go to you and say, hey, thank you very much for trusting us, we're a very good investment bank, as per the definition, and that means that I can actually guarantee with a high degree of certainty that I will only lose 25,000 of those 100,000 euros. That's with the 75% chance, which is pretty good. I might lose a lot more, but that's less likely. And you go like, wait a minute, wasn't I supposed to make money with investments? And we're running our companies based on this. I mean, and you know, it's not me. This is three PhDs in estimates. Talk about brain waste. These guys spend all of their life studying estimates, and this is the best they can come up with. What? I feel. When I see guys like this writing things like this, I feel it is irresponsible of me to promise anyone that an estimate can be accurate. That's how I feel about it. Of course, you have to make your own decisions. But if this is the best we can come up with, I'm saying I'm not playing that game. I don't want to go into a casino where when I lose, I die. So this is principle four, use alternatives. And there are alternatives to estimate-driven decision-making. Here's an example of a uh, company, 17 projects in that company. Average delay was 62%, so pretty close to the chaos report. And this is data I collected, so I trust it. And you have 17 projects here, aligned by order of being on time. So this was very much on time, small delay, but not that much. And this was like, what? 250% late. But here's the thing, project number one, I have no clue what that project was about. I don't remember, I don't know who ran that project, maybe it was even me, I don't know. Like, I really don't remember that project. Project 17 saved the company, created a new product that created new revenue streams, entered new markets, and is now, for that particular company, generating more than 50% of the revenues. So. I'm not just telling you that it's unlikely you will ever be good at estimates. I'm also telling you that if you are good at estimates, it doesn't matter. Like being good at estimates is like being good at putting your ice hockey goalkeeper mask when you are the, you know, forward. It's like it's the wrong problem to solve. It's like it doesn't help you. This project was the most successful project ever for that company. And it was, from an estimate's point of view, the worst project ever for that company. So here's the thing. Estimates are hard to get right, and when you get them right, you still lose. I will skip this because I'm running out of time, and I need to keep this to the time box. But I'll just mention the principle. Do not focus on being on time. Focus on being on value. When you're delivering something, Test the value of that something. If there is no value, there's no point in delivering it. That's just how it is. So, I, in, for the book, I interviewed nine people. This is just one of the two CEOs I interviewed that are actually using no estimates in their company. So it's definitely worth checking out if you want to know more. But, no estimates is actually alive and kicking in real companies. Principle six is that the people who use no estimates have understood that estimation is waste. And they have focused on ways to reduce the impact of estimates in their work. That's it. That's as simple as it is. You can't get rid of estimates today, probably, but what you can do is to look at the data. And once you have the data, you don't need to make decisions based on the estimates. Stepwise approach. Principle seven is measure progress only with validated running software. It's like, do not believe any Gantt charts. Do not believe any PowerPoint reports. Look at the software that is running and check what has already been delivered. 
that's what matters. And also this means that it doesn't matter what the estimate said, what matters is what you have running today. Now there's this very common anti-pattern in estimation, which is like the moment you give an estimate, I can now bargain. Like if you tell me it will take two weeks to deliver this, I can now actually say, come on, you know, I've been an engineer before. It took a lot less when I was there. Here's a real example of, yeah, that's how I feel. Uh, here's a real example of a team. This is their delivery velocity. So, you know, between one and five, but mostly between two and four stories for 21 sprints. And here's the target. What? Like, do we even know what we're talking about? This is just one of the four estimate dysfunctions, and you can see how well I estimated the number of dysfunctions there. <laughs> but there are more, right? Internal politics, like, hey, you have a good feature in your project, join it to my project, and then we can bank together, and then, you know, get our project approved, and his doesn't get approved, right? It, gets, it happens all the time, right? Internal politics. Blame shifting, you give me an estimate of two weeks, when you're late, it's now your fault, right? Familiar with that? Late changes. Who loves late changes? Who wants late changes? Come on. Who really gets pleasure out of late changes? Unless you tell them the estimate. But the idea is that late changes are where the value is at. That's what you know the best, when you know the best, what the product is about, what value you're delivering. So late changes should be welcomed. Right? In the book I call it, you know, normally it's called scope creep. In the book I call it value discovery, because that's what late changes are about. They are value discovery. Why would we say no to that? It's like, what? Come on, that's what we want. And then sunk cost fallacy, as in, we've already spent a million in this, why not spend another 500,000? Right? You're probably familiar with that. So principle eight is that the system where you work has predictable outputs, and this is the example. If you look at the data, you can actually make decisions based on the system that is already there. If you want to improve the output of a team, do not try to force them into do more work, because you know what happens? The bug count goes up, and then later on you pay for it. Or triple, or 10 times. So here's an example, a real example from a real team that really did a study about no estimates in their context. And this is what I would uh, advise you to do. So they did the whole estimates for the backlog, and it, they used one, three, and five, which is better than using the whole scale, but anyway, they estimated the whole backlog. This is their backlog. Blue things are points that have been delivered, the blue bars. The red bars are points that are still in the backlog. And you can see it's going up, no surprise. But this is also going up. So they projected the lines and they said, OK, the release will be 20th of October 2014. But then they said, hey, what if we did some Excel magic? Hmm? And we just changed the estimates, right? Instead of 135, we now have 123. It's not even the same relative scale. Wow, it's 14th of October. It's still two minutes, I can see in the watch there. Uh, so release of 14th of October, and you go like, well, that's not very different. What if we remove the estimates altogether? <gasps> release 29th of September. So here's the conclusion. He did three different estimates for the same work. Three different estimates. And they were within three weeks of each other in a 38 to 42 week project. That's an 8% margin. That's a hell of a lot better than what the PhDs in estimates have promised us. Bill Hanlon was the guy who did this experiment. Principle nine, don't bet your company in methods that have a poor track record. And by the way, you can do better than the definition of a good estimate by just counting the number of stories. So that's cool. We're learning something. Principle number 10 is that do not try to convince anyone, because the transformation starts with you. If you have data, just do this experiment, like Bill did. Do it on your own project. Convince yourself before you try to convince anyone. 
But I did promise an 11th principle. So here's the thing. I used to live in Stuttgart, and I needed to take a plane in Frankfurt. I either make the plane or don't make the plane. I planned everything. I knew exactly how long it took. I knew the road to take. I was on time. I was driving up, and I was about here, and then this happened. <laughs> Why do we structure projects as if we were trying to catch a plane? Projects should not be a one or zero thing. Actually, get rid of projects. Deliver value all the time. Because if you deliver value all the time, estimates are no longer important. Like, they're not even relevant. You ask, what can we deliver tomorrow? Oh, this. OK, fine. Tomorrow comes. Did we deliver? No. Mm, OK. But what did we deliver? Oh, we delivered this thing. OK, let, let's do this. Constant adaptation. This is what Agile is about. So no projects. But even though you don't do projects, don't forget, do not try to convince anyone before you convince yourselves. Thank you very much. And I'm not sure we will have time for Q&A, but I'll be around for a few more minutes just so that the speaker can set up, and then we'll meet also in the coffee break if you wish. So thank you very much for being here. <laughs>